David. Um, our panel today is called Building an Effective Security Culture Program. We have our moderator, Dr. Jessica Barker. <laughs> Dr. Barker is an author, keynote speaker, and co-founder of the cybersecurity company Sygenta. Uh, we have panelist Maxie Reynolds. She is a now subsea <laughs> engineer, used to be hacker, and author of the book Attacker Mindset. We have Rebecca Markwick. <laughs> Security awareness and culture specialist with a focus on ethics and semiotics. And at the very end, we have Sam Davidson. She is the head of... <laughs> Sam is the head of security and privacy engineering at Etsy and co-founder of the Proper Villains Security Network. Woo woo. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this panel on security culture and how to build an effective security culture program. So, culture, right? It's rocketed up the agenda, I'm saying it, in the cybersecurity and infosec communities and industry. We've been hearing that word so much more in recent years compared to the, like, decades before. Um, and here we are, we're at DEF CON, and we're having a panel on security culture. So that's amazing. But I often find there is a lot of confusion. What does culture mean? How do we influence a culture in an organization? And maybe most importantly, how do we measure it? How do we know if it's going right or wrong or somewhere in between? So that's what we're here to talk about today. And I'm very excited to have the next hour with this amazing panel who you've met in the introductions, and you'll be hearing from a lot in terms of their knowledge and their experience in this space. I'm gonna be asking questions. I have so many questions I can ask this panel, um, but I'm also gonna be opening up to you. So please take note of any questions that you have. We've got mics in the aisles of either side. So do note down any questions you have, you will have an opportunity to ask them. But let's get going. First up, I'm gonna turn to Maxi. And for the opener, I would love your thoughts on what does a good cybersecurity culture look like? What does that even mean? Um, so my position, my start position is sort of obvious in that cybersecurity culture is a subculture of any organization's overall culture. So like not ground breaking. Um, there's always a, either a direct causal link between them or there's a high positive correlation. And if you look at it through that lens, I think the hallmark of a good cybersecurity culture or otherwise is a learning based culture, which is cliche, but like, give me a second. Um, you sort of, you learn, you test, you get and you give feedback and then no one's penalized for failing the test. Put more, I guess, quantifiably, I firmly believe and have, have sort of seen throughout my time in cybersecurity that the level and volume of communication required within an organization is inversely proportional to the level of trust. You shouldn't have to cajole downwards and you shouldn't have to like go on strike to, to be heard upwards. So I, I, I do believe that. And then the other feature, I suppose, of good cybersecurity culture specifically is around having processes wrapped within the narrative, not the reverse or inverse. That's just a headache. You want the processes to be the thing that you can build on. They're effective, they're efficient, they're functional. You can't have that if it's, you've got this company narrative, your culture checklist, and you're trying to checklist it off and process it around that, it, it, it just doesn't work. Are you taking notes because you're going to ask me follow-up questions? I have no more than this. Maybe this later. Is <laughs> Maybe later, um, you know. Okay. And I also think that, like, counter to some of the things I've just said, culture actually isn't everything. And, and I think that, like, bankruptcy courts and corporate graveyards are filled with companies that had impeccable culture. Like, it really isn't everything. What you really need is strong leadership combined with, like, an engaged and smart workforce. And if you have those two things, you can create the conditions for a good culture, whether it be cybersecurity or otherwise. 
So I guess that's my position. Love it. Graveyards filled with companies yes. of good culture. <laughs> I am going to turn to Sam next for your thoughts, whether that's building on Maxi's or whether you want to take us in a different direction. What does a good cybersecurity culture look like? What does that mean? Yeah, so I think this can be broken down into two different populations. One, the culture within your security organization, and then the culture that um, you know is broader within your organization beyond the walls of your security team. And you know, a sign of a good security culture within your organization are people excited to show up to work every day? Are they motivated to do their job? Are they performing well? Are they collegial with each other and with the broader uh, organization at large? And then, you know, signs of a good security culture within your broader organization, does the rest of the company hide from you or do they approach you when they have problems? Do they come to you proactively to tell you about the incidents that they have or do they hide it from you as long as they possibly can before they engage you? And when are you engaged in the development process? Is it as early as possible? Or again, is it as late as they possibly can engage you when you might not have a chance to, to fix the things that are within their designs? Do people come to you or do they hide from you? <laughs> if you're starting to think about security culture, that's a really good question to start with. And if the answer is, I don't know, yikes. But we'll probably talk about how you might find out. But we'll come to that later. Um, one thing I'm hearing in both answers as a theme is that relationship between organizational culture and security culture. And I'm seeing Rebecca nodding, and I'm coming to you next. Yeah, so when I think of security culture and how I explain it to people when they inevitably ask me, what is the difference between awareness and culture? It's awareness is a subset of culture, and security culture is how well security is integrated within your wider organization. If your organizational culture is one that's very cohesive and it's very much a, we're gonna ask questions, no one's got stupid questions, then it's likely that you're gonna have an easier time getting a positive security culture in that. Because if you have an organization which is very sort of negative generally, people don't like it, people aren't enjoying it, then it's gonna be much harder to get something like security, which a lot of people hate, to fit well into that. So building on what you said earlier about how early it is in the, the projects that security comes in, that's how it's integrated into the wider whole, but also how comfortable and frequently people interact with your security team and how well the security team interacts with the users. Because oftentimes, some parts of the security team are great and they have a really good vibe with everyone. And the rest of the time, people are like, oh, no, that guy picked up my ticket. I, I don't really want to answer his questions. I'm going to... I'm just going to close that and ignore it. So it's, it's sort of a two-way thing. What will your end users think of the company as a whole, of how it is to work there? And then security culture itself fits into that as a little puzzle piece. You can't have one without the other. And you can't focus on security culture by itself without also thinking about the wider organizational culture, the business culture, the economic culture. Otherwise, you'll be banging your head constantly against a wall. Yes, if you're trying to change or if you're trying to meet a different culture when you've got security culture going one way, organizational culture going another, hitting that brick wall. And we'll probably come back to that later. You've all started to hint at this, but I really want to kind of dig into it in more detail, which is whether there is a particular red flag or set of red flags that really say to you, actually, we've got a negative security culture here. And Sam... I'm going to ask you to take that one first, if I may. Yeah. So I think a major red flag would be, does the organization even know that you exist? Do they know <laughs> who to contact when they have a problem? And I know I hinted this already, but do they feel safe contacting you when they, they do have a problem? If they don't, that's a major red flag. I know that sentiment surveys are also becoming increasingly popular within organizations. So sending those out to be like, what are your interactions with the security team, is it positive? Um, and really diving deep into those results to figure out where your, your team has opportunities to have a better partnership with the rest of the business because security is an enablement function at the end of the day. 
So if someone wants to do that, if someone wants, they maybe hasn't explored security culture at all, and they want to start asking those questions, Sam, what do you recommend security professionals do? Ooh. Um, well, one step could be partnering with your, your HR function. And I know that this is not always a, a popular department for you to interact with within your, your corporation. But they're, you know, they do have a particular um, expertise, which is cultural sentiment in the organization at large. So that would be the, the first place that I would go to see if they already have existing material that you can draw upon to send out some of these surveys. Yep, so if there's an annual survey or a pulse survey, can you sneak a question or two in? I think that's really fantastic practical advice uh, for people to take away. And um, Rebecca, what are your thoughts? Yeah, um, I have two big red flags that I look out for. One is the quality of the template email that people in the SOC send to the end users. Uh, how nice and friendly it is for the end users. Do they feel attacked? Do they feel overwhelmed by random gibberish they don't know? Is it accusatory? And um, the second one is generally the wording of people in security talking about everybody else. Do they say that people are giving away their passwords or do they say that people have their passwords stolen? Because one is victim blaming and blaming people that have no other way of protecting themselves because they probably haven't helped them. And the other one is acknowledging that people are attacked constantly and that it's our job to help them. And I find those are my two big red flags. So if you're looking at those emails, if we take that first red flag, which I think is a great example, if you're looking at that, like how do you do that analysis? Do you have a template you use? Do you have certain words you look for as either good or bad? What do you draw on? Yeah, so I have a background in sort of um, literature, linguistics, semiotics. And the semiotics is the study of signs. So that's icons, language, um, the associations that you have with them and the meaning you take. How things are phrased. Have you explained things? So if you have a flag on companies using like a VPN, have you explained in your email what a VPN is? That it's a virtual private network and it's that button that you press to join the corporate network. Is it saying an alert's happened and we're just checking to, to double check it's you or saying, we had a thing come in and we want to know whether you did it or not. And they're like, what's that alert? I don't know what a VPN is. Uh, have I done something wrong? Am I going to be in trouble? Is my manager going to yell at me? Am I going to get a thing on my record that, oh my God, what's happening? Versus, hi, we've had a security alert come up and we get these quite frequently when people accidentally use like the wrong VPN. If you're on your phone, it's a virtual private network. A lot of people have them for security. If you don't use the corporate network, then we just get a flag and we'd love to check whether you know you used your phone, in which case we'll close it out. No problem. Just remember to use the corporate network. And if it wasn't you, then we're going to help you secure it because someone might have stolen your account. You know, you've got a lot more information. You're more conversational. People feel less stressed because for us, it's an everyday occurrence multiple times a day, depending on your size of your organization. But for that user, it could be the first time they've ever had anything like that crop up. And they are terrified. Generally, people get scared when they hear security. And you've got to be really, really aware of that. And the words that you use and the associations people have with them and the way you phrase it can have a really big impact. You ask the same question in two different ways. Someone's going to be thrilled to answer you. Someone's going to want to never answer that email and run away and hide. And that's something we've definitely seen if people have been in for the vishing competition, competition in the village yesterday, the cold calls today. Language was so key in whether people were socially engineered or not. And so we can use that on the good side, you know, and we can be seeing actually the language we're using is going to either positively influence the people who are not in security in our organization, or it's going to put them off. So what I'm hearing from you is translating those messages and looking at language with empathy. Yeah, you're basically flipping social engineering on its head. You're instead of trying to get information from people, you're trying to give them information. So it's they social it engineering for good. Yes, that's what I tend to say. And Maxi, um, you were nodding. Yeah, I mean, I, I sort of agree. Social engineering in and of itself is about how someone perceives you. That, that really is the, the kernel, the crux of it. It's often sort of misunderstood and people think the inverse is true. Um, so, so I agree with that. And that was the nod. And in terms of the red flags, 
that you think indicate a negative security culture in an organization? What springs to mind? Anything, you know, from like a team point of view, I think at any level of, of the organization, if every good idea has a thousand parents and every bad idea is an orphan, that's a huge red flag and it carries through the entire organization. It's sort of accountability culture, you, the outcome matters more than the process and you, that's really difficult to build good culture and awareness on. I think probably that matters most. We all have this tendency in life to think if something goes well for us, it was skill and if something goes bad, it was, it was luck. But it's actually, if we live in a cause and effect world, that, that can't be true. And so I think probably that's a big red flag across any organisation. Accountability culture, love that. Yeah, I, I made it up myself today. <laughs> Trademark, <laughs> yeah. you did it here first, everybody. Um, so one thing that's coming through in the answers so far for all of these questions is around that wider organisational culture. Because it can be whether an organization has an accountability culture and that influences security. So then that's a challenge, isn't it? We are, there's only so much influence we can have on these things that actually really directly impact security culture. I'm what not sure think? we have the start influence here, like uh, insecurity, awareness and culture. I don't think, I think we, I think we can perform, but I don't know if we can actually facilitate on a grand scale. It really has to be more than us and we're sort of, tacked on positively. I've never seen the security culture become the overall culture. So I, I don't know how that works. We need time to think about that. Yes. Sam, do you have any thoughts on that one? If we're in an organization where the wider culture is challenging, maybe there's not that accountability culture or that trust that we've spoken about, insecurity, what can we then do? Because that massively influences us. Can we do anything? What are your thoughts? Yeah, I, th I think at that stage, it comes down to trying to understand the interests of the organization and appealing to that through your messaging. Because at the end of the day, security culture and the activities that we do are largely social engineering. So trying to figure out what do our team members care about and how can we um, create our, our messaging and our, our appeals to things that promote you know, what is already their self-interest and why they come to work every day and, you know, why we do what we do. Well, harnessing yeah. that organizational culture. Right? Yeah, I think um, if a company has within the structure, uh, like cybersecurity values built into the mission statement or just the company values, that's sort of really annoying. That uh... Mike, feedback, any any thoughts on the mic feedback situation <laughs> one two <laughs> i think you can engender a sense of obligation if there's something baked into the company and fix the culture a, a little bit that way like you just have to let them know it is important and if they have that baked in i think you said something similar if they have that baked in it becomes a little bit easier because again you engender that sense of obligation for the company very cool and so this leads us very nicely, uh, a handy little segue um, into the sort of subtopic of awareness. And we talked about that. Um, and Rebecca, you specifically mentioned that about awareness being a sub area of culture. And so I want to kind of focus on awareness and security awareness for a little bit and really think about what can move the needle. And in your experience, what have you seen move the needle? Particularly from your perspective, Rebecca, in a global role, when you're thinking about different countries, different cultures, how do you manage awareness raising to make it effective? Yeah, so awareness is that little subset and it's the bit where you're the visible face of security. So if we're thinking people don't like security, we want to shove them into loving security and coming to us for help and asking all of the questions, like people have said. Um, so like I said, I have a background in semiotics. And semiotics, like I said, is the study of signs. And it's very particularly the association people have with the concept of signs, whether that's assigned things like language that we are taught, or whether it's icons, like I show you Angus, you know he's a Highland cow because he looks like a Highland cow. Uh, and stuff like that. So when you look at that, the associations people make are specific to their cultures and their subcultures. So in the West, 
We identify things like the color red as being bad, angry, stop, don't do it. But if you have red in Asia, it's a sign of prosperity and generosity and good, and good luck. So if you brand everything bad as red and then shove it in Asia, it's not going to work. People have no association. If you go even deeper into subcultures, there are subcultures within organizations, which is why we've been saying it's so important to see the wider organizational culture. So when you're designing your training, you have to identify the semiotics of the place that you work. What works? Is it fun and friendly and they're going to love a cute little cow like Angus? Then great. If they're super serious, then putting Angus there is going to be really, really detrimental. They're going to hate it. You want something really serious or anywhere in between on the needle. And then you've got to think, will that work for everybody around the globe? We have subcultures. Will it work in Germany? Will it work in the Emirates? Will it work in Australia? Will it work in Japan? Will it work in China? Will it work all the way across America? Are we going to accidentally offend someone with mascots that we choose, with language that we're using, with the way we're asking people to do things? We can't have a one-size-fits-all approach. And a lot of people say, we can't have a one-size-fits-all approach. And then they do that anyway. You have to genuinely look at what it is you want people to learn, what it is you want people to know, and how they're going to do it. And then look at the culture that they sit in and the subcultures, like we are all a subculture here, hackers, and then a sub-subculture of people who are into social engineering. So what's going to work for them? And then redesign it so that the same concept is there. We want you to do X, Y, Z but we're telling you how to do it A, B, C over here. We're telling you how to do it E, F, G over here. The outcome is the same. We have to identify the learning objectives and then apply the semiotic associations so that it's really unambiguous how people learn, how people do things, what they need to do. Because you can't just tell people to do, this is super obvious over here because we've made it red. It is bad. And then half your companies in Asia and go, well, they're really stupid. They don't know what they're doing. And it's like, no, that's on you. It's on you to identify all of those different areas and say, OK, we have red as bad over here. And we're going to do something else as bad over here because, oh, look, it works. You know, it's taking away the end user is stupid and coming from a training background saying, how do people learn? How do we make it unambiguous? And then let people learn, you know. Let people learn. Love it. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, Sam, I would love to hear a bit about your approach um, to really moving the needle on security awareness, really engaging people, and how you approach that in an organization. Yeah, so I really subscribe to the BJ Fogg model of behavioral change. So, you know, we're really trying to promote actions that are small, easy to do, that our employee base is highly motivated to do. So that starts with threat modeling and really understanding what those actions are that are going to reduce their personal risk and the risk to the organization. Um, and then from there, it's about trying to meet them where they're at and where they're going to engage with you. And I think that will really vary from organization to organization um, and even within different populations within your organization as well. Yes, and I think that's it, isn't it? And that's something you know both of you have touched on. There is no one size fits all, and it's about meeting people where they are and understanding where they are even before then. Um, for you, Sam, one thing I'm really interested in, as well as your role with Etsy, you also have a company and you work with high net worth individuals and celebrities. So you're dealing with some, you mentioned different populations within an organization but you're dealing with different populations in society as well. And I wondered if you could share anything about how you meet, the, meet those different groups where they are. Yeah, so I think where they start to diverge you know, initially is with their threat model. The threat actor for a celebrity tends to be a little different than the average employee within the organization. Um, additionally, with the you know, actions that we're trying to encourage them to take, you know, I don't have a lot of controls to help them when my celebrity client drops their phone in the pool every week. I don't have an MDM. Um, so There is like more than one story there, right? Yes, yes. <laughs> Um, so I want to make sure that the actions that I am subscribing to them are also ones that you know, they have the ability to self-recover from if something goes wrong. 
Um, and then also the way that I disseminate the information to them is very different. Within an organization, I'm trying to appeal to scale. Um, when I'm uh, handling celebrities or high net worth individuals, it's usually one-to-one -one coaching and guidance or text communication. They have even lower attention spans than the average employee within your organization. I can't believe that, but we won't quote you on it with your clients. Um, is it almost like with an exec audience? More of that, so that's how people in the room could maybe think about it, is thinking about those high net worth individuals and celebrities like the execs, where there's gonna be more hand-holding, more of that one-on-one. -on -one. Yes, absolutely. In fact, some of our clients are also executives within organizations where the security staff wants to create a barrier for privacy between their internal security team and the person who is helping their executive staff. Makes perfect sense. Thank you. Um, and Maxi, what about you, thinking about what really moves the needle for awareness? I sort of come at this from a very different viewpoint now. So I'm, I started off in cybersecurity um, and our job, we were basically consultants, so we went out to companies. One of the skills I think you require is to make awareness sellable. And I just didn't have that skill at that time. And now that I run a company, I kind of think of things differently and not to get too down to the weeds. But if I have 10 engineers that work for me in my current company, they will work collectively 20,000 hours for me next year. If I put in four hours into a training course and eight hours into like providing that, delivering that to them, and it results in a 1% increase in efficiency, I gain for my 12 hours of input, like 200 hours, like equivalent of 200 hours next year. I wish when I was in cybersecurity that I was going out to companies and saying to them, hey, for X amount of time and X amount of dollars, with a 1% increase in your security posture, like awareness or just even the, the cultural awareness, you can save yourself X amount of dollars downtime, revenue lost or days downtime just by that. I think there's like this real skill, it's sort of overlooked in our culture of selling awareness. Mm -hmm. um, and that's selling the ROI, isn't it? Yeah. That's really selling yeah, yeah, the return yeah. on, on investment. So it's not just marketing skills, but that's a lot of business acumen as well. Yeah, yeah. There's an extra thing on that, just very quickly, sorry, diving in, rude. Um, is budgets for security awareness are generally really low. Yeah. Um, companies like just giving a bit of money to a random company that will give you a bunch of generally not brilliant stuff for everyone. Um, where, where I am now is fantastic because I have a, a good budget. I have Angus, I have money to do rewards. I can get stickers, I can get prizes, I can make tiny Anguses for people if they do really good. I can follow through on the whole positive reinforcement works to train people. I come from a training and behavioral change background. Negative reinforcement doesn't work. Yelling at people, scaring them doesn't work. Teaching at the point of failure doesn't work. And having a budget is essential to positive reinforcement. So getting that return on investment stuff in, not only on the we can save you time and energy and effort and all of that jazz, but also if we put the money into the budget for positive reinforcement rewards and making nice, good content, you're way more likely to get actual behavior change and people following and coming to you for training and help than if you just use the here's 20 grand for this really rubbish training that everybody hates and then they hate security. Money, money, money. Uh, Sam, how do we get the money for awareness and culture? Ooh, well. <laughs> right, million dollar question, like literally. Because it's, it's so true that organizations will spend a fortune on the tech. We walk around this week and we see so many technical solutions. We all pretty much are you know, acknowledging and agreeing that the human factor is the most important part here, and yet the budget for training and culture is often very small compared to the budget for the shiny, blinky things. What can we do to influence that and try and get some more budget? Yeah, well, I, I think the first step in the process is having a metrics-based approach for the implementation of your security, culture, engagement, awareness program, whatever we're calling it these days. Um, mm -hmm. 
And then I, I think you have more questions for us on that. So I'm going to segue into my, my second key point here, which is around, I think, the misconception around how much um, things like you were just talking about actually cost. One of my greatest tricks in my toolbox is actually going to the design team and asking them for resources um, to develop you know, in-house uh, visualizations and training. And more often than not, they're like, we don't have time to help you. But then I ask for a list of contractors that they've worked for or, or worked with already that you know, are familiar with uh, the brand design and typically they cost a fraction of what the vendors in this space cost for you know pre-canned and packaged training which is not as effective so there's i think different mechanisms that you can deploy to get ha um, higher roi for the limited budget that you do have being creative, building up those relationships internally in an organization. That's come through as, as a theme of your answer, Sam, of actually what can you do to leverage the resources and the relationships you already have internally? And I love that approach. And you're right, metrics. We've just laid a little hook there. Speaking of marketing, we've opened that loop. You're all thinking about metrics now, but we're not talking about it yet. We're coming back to that later. So stay tuned. I want to bring in a really important topic now. We're obviously in the social engineering village. We've been talking about fishing. We're moving into fishing. I'm going to have to bring it up. We can't talk about this topic and not talk about fishing simulations, right? So I want to get into people's perspectives. And I'm going to leave this open to begin with. And then we're probably going to dig into the details. Um, so Rebecca, I'm coming to you first for what do you think of fishing simulations? I hate them. We should all put them in the bin. Um. <laughs> I mean, cut to the chase. Tell us what you really think. I know, right? Um, I have a problem with them on a number of levels. In my intro, I have a specialty in semiotics, which I've already rabbited on about, but also ethics and how red teaming skill based ethics impacts security culture, that next step after the actual red team. And a lot of what I do, like you said, you like BJ Fogg. I've worked in behavioral change a lot. BJ Fogg is fantastic. Go read him. He is amazing. Um, but when you change behavior, you have to make things easy. So you set people up for success. You reward the behavior that they do, and you repeat it. And it works. It's great. It's simple. You say that. Yeah. Um, but you have to set people up for success. And the way that phishing simulations are traditionally done sets people up for failure. And then they get yelled at for failing and people feel bad, and then you're training at the point of failure, which is proven to not work. Um, but people love click rate metrics, and it's been like a decade since clicking a link has been an actively like, attackable thing. It's the stuff afterwards. I don't care how many links you click. We're telling people to share all their documents as links because we're using cloud services now, and then we're telling them, don't click links. They're evil. But please, share everything as a link, you know, because you've got to be secure. There's cognitive dissonance. People are going to do with their job. They're going to use the links. I don't care. Click the links as much as you like. It's the step after that. And there's stuff that you can put in to teach people about how phishing works, urgency and heightened emotions, very basic, and practices around it so that the simulations themselves are generally only necessary when your cyber insurance requires that you have them. So it's like, great, well, now we need to do the phishing simulations. So if you're in this situation where you can't just bin the simulations, which a lot of us are in, I personally have a, like a halfway house between them where I make fishing simulations that say, hi, I'm a fish. Do you know what to do with me? Here's a fish that someone reported last week. And then see how many people report it. Because the behavior we want with fishing isn't really not clicking links. It's reporting the fish, right? So if our simulations are just tricking people into doing stuff so that someone in IT or security or our external red team go, I'm amazing, then that's not really helping our end users. You know, If we're helping them, giving them, you mentioned the safe spaces earlier, a safe space to practice a behavior that people aren't good at, and then you reward them for it, you're going to get better at reporting stuff. And you can still gather your click rate metrics if you need them. And over time, shrink your click rate metric on the slide for your executives down and boost up the reporting ones so that we can kind of move away from basically vanity metrics. And I know there's madness happening over here, so I will 
hand over because I know I'm unpopular. Madness happening. <laughs> <laughs> Click the links, people. Now that's something we don't often hear at DEF CON, not like maybe we do, but from different sources. Um, <laughs> and how long until the scammers are sending fishes saying, I'm a fish, click me. Um, but Maxi, I want to bring you in. What are your thoughts? So I, I will put a pin in whether or not there is an opportunity cost around fishing. Like if, if you can be doing something better, do that. If that's not an option for you, then do the fishes. And I have an ex I think like a fairly controversial viewpoint on the topic, like fishing topics. I firmly believe that we should test on some of the more emotive subjects and like everything, there's like some right ways to do it and probably a lot of wrong ways to do it. So let's like the most proximate thing is probably money. So tell your organization, hey, we will never contact you this way for like your bonus. This is the process. This is how it will happen. You've given them the answers to the homework. Test them based on that. If they fail, it's a huge red flag and like such a good opportunity for, for learning. Um, and I also think that like there's no other area in life where you don't test because it might not be like imagine saying to your kids you don't want to sit your driving test take the car go on the freeway we don't care we don't want you to be sad if you fail like you don't do that i would never get in a car where the manufacturer said we're actually we didn't crash test it because we didn't want to test the like structural integrity in case it hurt the engineer's feelings like that doesn't happen we it can't be like that so you so you, i think test on the more emotive subjects but do it in a fair way Controversial, or is it? Or is it? I'm going to be asking for a show of hands in a minute, but I want to make sure um, that Sam can come in. What are your thoughts on fishing simulations? I think that they should only be done as a metrics gathering exercise to see the susceptibility yeah. of your organization to social engineering attacks. And I think they should only be done um, you know, completely homegrown and internally, likely as part of a red team engagement. Also, they should have their own rules of engagement that are set yeah. at the start before you do any simulations. There should be no teachable moments, no training that results from the simulations. And I think that if you have to allow list a domain to get the phishing <laughs> email through to the inbox, that's not very good data that you're gathering. 100 percent yeah okay that's getting it come on you can applaud you can applaud let's do it <laughs> and that got agreement i think across yeah. the panel yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah so rules of engagement making sure that it's not just it's not even about training it's not about a training or teachable moment it's about that bigger data set and what it tells you now i want to come back to the oh maxi no it's fine yeah, yeah no, are you I sure? to, like, <laughs> lynch me on my way out. I want to um, I want to come back to the um, emotive bait. We're going to have some audience participation. This is very exciting. I want a show of hands. Should we be using emotive bait in phishing simulations? Who says yes? We should. There's no right or wrong answer. I'm not going to be telling you off. No one's telling you off. <laughs> So we've got some yeses, a fairly substantial number. Couple who are like, I'm not sure, I'm not committing, commit people. <laughs> oh yes, that was very, yeah, you're keen on it. Um, and who is saying no? Some neutrals in the room, I like that. Interesting, I will it's kind of a similar number. So this, I'm guessing either lots of undecided or lots of tired, <laughs> you know? <laughs> we, can we can relate. Oh, and it depends, favorite. Both right, yeah. Does it depend? Does it depend on the culture? Does it depend on where you are? Yeah, we're getting some nods. Maybe not completely committed. Context? So it depends on the bait. Right? Yeah, Maybe? Like we, I don't think, like, it's not like, hey, click this link because we have your children. And you, like, <laughs> it is a rat. It's got to be proximate. Oh, well, that might work. I'm glad you clarified. You know, yeah. we're going into the deep fake. <laughs> virtual kidnapping here people no um okay thank you thank you to those who put their hands up um and now i want to maybe this will be part of it 
but I don't want to lead your answers. I want to talk about the biggest myths or the biggest bugbears, the things that really frustrate you that you think are just not true or annoying around security culture and awareness. And Maxi, I'm going to look at you. Oh, great. Um, so I've got sort of two that really like grind to my gears. Um, the, the first one is cultural and the second one is awareness. I will go cultural first. Tell me if you've got enough time for awareness. Culturally within this industry and actually all, I hate, I hate the use of the word family to describe a company yeah, yeah, or yeah. anyone within it. I hate it. <laughs> that deserves applause. We are not like this is we are not running a cult like your company isn't a cult for one It's a massive red flag It is a way that your employer is saying to you. I'm going to circumvent all professional boundaries and like don't take it for anything else other than that. Why would you want work to feel like a family? I can feel myself. I'm getting a rash and like I'm actually upset about this. Let me I'm pull, sorry. I need a little sorry, Mitch McConnell moment. I'm going to have to like take a pause here. I'm going to like crack up. I think that it, we shouldn't use that word. We are peers. Peers can become friends. God, some of us could get married and become family. Generally, though, we are not family. It's a huge red flag. If you hear it, run away from it. It's manipulative. It's devious. It's underhanded. And like, I, I don't like it. Yes, I'm going to I'm gonna pause you there. Yes. I know you've got more to say on this, but we've got a couple more questions that are, and I really, really want to open to the audience. So, um... I know I'm opening a can of worms and we could all talk about this for hours, but a brief thought on biggest bugbear myth frustration. I'm coming to you, Rebecca. Uh, that end users are stupid and it's their fault. Yes, um. yes, yes, yes. <laughs> we're not applauding the statement, we're applauding yeah. how annoying the yeah, statement yeah. is, just to yeah. clarify. <laughs> um, and now, uh, Sam, what about you? That security is everyone's responsibility. Oh my God, yes. <laughs> There's no action there. Should have had a bingo. Like we security bingo. awareness, we annoying bingo. things, bingo. Because yeah, I think we've hit them. That's fantastic. Um, I promised we'd come back to metrics. What does good look like? How do we know if this stuff is working around awareness and culture? And um, I'd love your thoughts on metrics. You brought them up a couple of times, Sam. So I'm coming to you first. Yeah, so I think for me, the most important metrics are broken down into three main buckets. You know, how are we influencing behavior change? How are we understanding if uh, our employee base is picking up knowledge? And what is their engagement with the activities that we are putting forth to them? And a really great example that I have of this uh, is a fishing workshop. Pretty basic, um, but something that I've done at uh, multiple organizations at this point. Um, someone, uh, either myself or from my team, will organize workshops for the whole company where employees are invited in to partner with each other. They share a few key pieces of information that they're comfortable sharing with their partner. And then they're asked to write phishing emails for the other person. Bonus points if they find some really great available domains also for their phishing email. Um, and then, you know, the key metrics that we take from this are, um, you know, one, what is the increase in volume of reports to the security team? But perhaps most importantly, what's the increase in accuracy of the reported uh, phishing emails to the security team? And across multiple organizations, we've seen an uptick in volume to the tunes of 50% and in accuracy to the tune of 80% after doing these activities. Um, so it's really great for um, being able to uh, you know, take a deeper dive into the behavior change metric um, and then knowledge because that accuracy increases and then engagement by who's actually attending the workshop and who's participating in it. Nice. Very cool. Very practical advice to take away and apply and think about. And, you know, maybe then you can have some people in your organization come in doing the vision competition because it's a similar thought process, right? It is, exactly. And there is going to be a report out of, on the metrics and the insights from the vision competition, I think, in a couple of months. Um, I noticed you were applauding, high-fiving, yeah, yeah. agreeing, Rebecca. Any extra I love on metrics. That? I also do make a fish workshops. People love them and... Genuinely, people learn through doing, and there's this weird sort of scariness about it, or they think it's just really badly spelt Nigerian prince emails. 
Um, but people have really good fun doing it. And when people have fun, they learn. And when they do things, they learn. And you can kind of, if you have a group situation like you do where you split people up, people can compare their fish. Um, people, you can fish Angus, you know, we have a little competition. You can make a fish for Angus because he has a little like bio about him for our company, uh, which is great because it's, it's sort of everyone can do it. So if they don't come to a workshop because we're global, because, you know, I, I don't get up at midnight to teach people, um, we've, got, we've got a thing you can practice against. Um, but I love metrics and I, I would go one step further with your buckets and split the knowledge one into two. I'm a big fan of people understanding that people know what they should answer and then they actually know what they should do and they actually do a thing. So a lot of people know what the questions are and they know the answers to the questions. Doesn't mean they really know how it works. And it doesn't mean they're actually doing it. So when I do metrics, I dive into that a little bit more and I get baseline knowledge of people by doing like fun rating things, like rating types of passwords. And then I repeat that really regularly so that I get a baseline of the knowledge changing. And then I get a bunch of data from like red teams, blue teams, et cetera, on, for example, the passwords to show whether people's knowledge is improving, is actually happening with the behavior that they're employing. Are the passwords getting better? Are the red team password audits taking longer and longer to happen? Or are they not? In which case, we need to redesign how we're moving knowledge into action. So I like to like chop it into tiny weeny pieces, but that's just me being pedantic inside your small bucket. I love the other buckets. The buckets are great. And that's it. I love the fact that we've talked about culture, we've talked about awareness, we've talked about behavior, and we're really digging into actually how do you see if this stuff works? Maxi, do you have anything you want to add on this one? You know, I think those answers were fairly comprehensive and I've really never been on the other side of it. I've always tried, like I was testing, so, so, so no. But I think one thing is how much data we can draw on that we're not necessarily gathering ourselves. Like if you're in an awareness role, there's so much data in the organization, as you said, from, you know, threat intel, threat modeling, blue team, red team, loads of other data that can tell us about people's behavior and then we can test to see how that progresses over time, depending on initiatives. But now I want to open to you all and see if anyone has a question for this amazing panel, anyone has something we haven't answered. Anywhere you want to go, we've got a couple of mics. Yes, please, if you could come to the mic. Oh, you can protect oh, nice, it. Nice. And I can say it back if <laughs> the back of the room can't hear it, so go. Gotcha. Great question. And also, I wish I had that power to project my voice. So I'm coming for top tips after this. I was gonna say, it's good very job. impressive. Um, so I think the question, if I understood it right, was if you're a company, you're acquiring another company, and how do you get those cultures to mesh? We've talked a bit about subcultures. And this is a great example, I think, of bringing together two different cultures. So who wants to take it? I'm looking at you, Rebecca. I'm, You're not in. I'm happy. Um, this is where semiotics really comes into its own uh, because you can deep. It's very academic. If anyone cares, come find me afterwards and I will talk for you for hours. Um, you look at the, the semiotics of the culture within each individual organization. And then you look at the new values that the company as a new whole wants to project and you hook onto those and you split yourself like you would if you're global like I am into splitting your training and your culture for those with a goal that over X many years, like two to three, it's all converging into the same concept. If you go in trying to make it one right from the start, it's not gonna happen. Behavior change takes months, if not years. Culture change takes years. You cannot do it fast unless you're super tiny. So you've got to look at the, the underlying concepts. One of those companies might have a really negative view of their security and the other one might be really positive. We don't want to damage the positive one. We want to bring the negative one up. If they're both kind of neutral, that's a bit easier. But if they're both positive, but they have very different cultures, one's fun, bouncy, Gen Z, Gen Z, yes. 
uh, and ones like full of people that are super serious banking people, you can't, you can't go, those are the same cultures. Whilst they're both positive, they're not the same. You're going to have to find a middle ground that fits for them, and there's a lot of trial and error there. And it's just take it slow, take the time to analyze, and slowly mesh it over years, is what I'm saying, because culture change takes years. If anyone says they can change your culture in a year, do not hire them. Um, <laughs> if you're looking at like three to five years for some change and like 10 years for significant change if you're really negative because people hate stuff, it's real difficult to change. I'm seeing you nodding. Does that answer your question? Do you have anything? And does anyone want to jump in and add to that? Or if not, I'm reaching back out. Yes. And if you want to go to the mic, if not, I'll say it back. I can project. Woohoo! So yell, yell away. So I'm curious, um, Mark, um, have y'all ever witnessed anything that has been destructive to a culture of security? And if so, can you kind of share as specific as you can, like what, this, what that occurrence was? I'm going to repeat the question back just in case anyone couldn't hear it, um, despite the great projection. Um, have you ever seen anything destructive to a security culture? And are you able to describe that in as much like, detail as you are able to? And I'm wondering if Sam has any thoughts on this one. Ooh, yeah, I'm, oh, I have so many examples to choose from. I'm <laughs> trying to pick which one which would can be you best share? to share. <laughs> yeah. um, ooh. Well, I, one example, we, at, at an organization that I worked at, we had a new leader join the security organization. And in the very first presentation that they gave to the company at large, they kind of effectively came in and said, you know, security really sucks here. Nice. How to motivate, how to influence. <laughs> yeah. Um, which made the rest of the company panicked because before that moment, they had largely had a really positive relationship with the security team. So I think, you know, even some of the messaging that you can have in like just, you know, 30 seconds with the organization can be enough to destroy it. Something that takes years to build and develop and then... I just knew the example was going to be a leader because that's what was springing to my mind. Yeah. I, all of these examples I'm thinking of, I was like, oh, yeah, there was that exec. And I don't want to exec shame, but I had just a sense. And um, how did you, are you able to share like how you overcame that? What did you do? Well, there's a lot of mini therapy sessions that occurred <laughs> with, with different parts of the organization after that, that all hands presentation, you know, trying to let them know that security really didn't suck, that, you know, our, our new leader was, you know, just trying to be maybe a little contrarian and, and kickstart some changes, but that it didn't change the um, impact that we had had prior to their arrival. Yeah. Maxi? Uh, I would say what I've personally witnessed is um, smaller companies are driven by personality, and it's not as true at large scale. It still matters, but it's not quite there, and I work, have worked for some smaller companies. And... I think the most destructive thing is when one person uh, sort of believes they are bigger than the culture that they're trying to instill, that's one. I think when someone or a group of people within an organization, it's telling me not to say it. <laughs> to say, say it. Uh, I think like you, you tend to find like little echo chambers throughout some of this, some companies. And um, if one personality is either very strong and destructive, that tends to be the leader that sort of thing. And people, like, we are such, like, tribal creatures in a way, and, and it really is destructive. That's it. You can yes. ask a follow-up question. Can I share? When, how did I overcome that? I would love. I don't want to share. <laughs> and I, I left, and I, I do not have the... I have a personality trait that goes for me and against me in terms of, like, I will not be bullied or bullied in America. Um, and thank you. <laughs> Subtitles available. Um, I, like, I just don't have it in me, and it's, like, cause for concern in some areas. But when I 
feel as though I am being like manipulated or bullied, I'll, obviously I want to make sure that that's the truth and it's not subjective feeling. That's hard in an organisation that is a large echo chamber of this one person's destructive nature or pathological insecurities and things. So all of that. I'm not entirely sure what I just said because it was all just processing in my memory. But like, yeah, I, 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 that's it. Get it out, yeah. safe space. <laughs> Um, okay, do we have any really other ready. questions? <laughs> so what we have, we have, this hand went up first, so I'm coming to you, Graham. And you can go to the mic if you want. Your mic might be kinder to you. <laughs> Just get closer to it. Hello. Nice and close. Oh, yes. Yes. Woo. Woo. <laughs> for the majority of this panel, um, it sounds like a lot of the talking points are like relevant to change point of interpretation. I I work on the offensive side. Um, and I'm just wondering if I've been in this for a while now. Like, oh, where do like where does the initial access to other economy come from? Like this work with employees, and that's like a result of poor culture. How, like, that is something that I, as a, like, stimulated adversary, capitalize on. Um, but I sometimes feel like I don't have the ability to keep on it. You guys have any experience, and this is kind of in the room, I guess, in the room later. Does anyone have any experience with being on the offensive side and, and approaching the client and, and kind of touching on those bottom points in? Or does that not seem to be a way to those Good question. I'm conscious of time. So I'm gonna go to Rebecca. Yeah. Um, I do a lot of sorry, speedy. I do a lot of work with red teams um, on like ethics and the being impactful without being like destructive of the culture that you're working to improve. Um, and generally, insider risk, insider threat type stuff comes down to, in my mind, two things. You have people aren't paid enough and they will do anything. I used to work in the government. That's the number one reason why people will insider. And then the other one is just like disgruntlement and things. And it's, in my mind, if you put it in your report in such a way that it is a cultural problem that you have discovered whilst red teaming, it's much easier to get some traction on that because it's a grabbable thing and you're not blaming anyone in particular, you're blaming like the organizational culture. And if you say that, you know, there's some disgruntlement and you think it was around this because these tactics that you used were successful, but maybe these ones over here weren't, then there's a particular problem here. This is the concept, whether it's pay, whether it's benefits, whether it's parking spots. I know a few people have done really successful red teams on like, we're reassigning parking spaces. Who wants one? Um, <laughs> Good. So tip. yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you if you think about it in as like a, an organisational blob, which bit of the blob is the problem, and then stage it in such a way that we red teamed, we noticed this thing, and it's an organisational problem. Here's some potential ideas about it. They don't have to be great ideas, but you can suggest that. They maybe work on the benefits package because a lot of people responded to the free gym fish, you know? Or when you were in the building, a lot of people responded to this type of talking. So there may be a, a problem in this area. And it might be an internal team is causing that problem. It might just be that people just don't like the thing, depending on where you live. You know, maybe traffic sucks and people love anything to do with traffic, you know? But if you phrase it as an organizational concept, you're more likely to get traction. Thank you, Rebecca. I know, I think you yeah. have a follow-up. Oh, no. no. Well, when I was red teaming, I think if I, if I were back in your position, what I would do is when I was briefing the execs, I would ask them if they think they have a cultural yeah. issue because that's like, get them to tell you and then see, oh yeah, do you know what, that, that actually adds up with what I saw here. It's really difficult to tell leaders of an organization yeah. they have a cultural problem. So I would ask them, and if they don't know about it, I, I would personally be spineless and, you know, <laughs> go over that. <laughs> but if they, if they knew about it, I would, I would back that up with some evidence. 
Fantastic practical advice. And again, <laughs> it's like touching on that social engineering tactic mm. of ask them, get them to open up to you. Use tactical empathy. Love it. I could keep asking questions, and I know there's more questions in the audience, but we're out of time because these panelists have been so great. Um, but I can't let them go without asking for their key takeaway. I have heard words like safety, trust, accountability culture, about the subcultures, the importance of the wider organizational culture, how we can use threat modeling, how we can liaise with stakeholders and meet people where they are over a period of years to change culture. But what I really want is a key takeaway from each of you. I'm looking for like a sentence. Um, also, like it has to fit in a tweet. Yes, I'm still calling them tweets. Don't come at me. And um, I'm going to start with you, Sam, if I may. Get creative, live off the land, and roll your own fishing. Love it. Thank yes. you. Rebecca? Yeah. Um, I'll go a little bit more sort of tiny, tiny, uh, which is start within your security team and how they view and think about the end users. Make them your friends, not the stupid people on the end of the email. Nice. <laughs> start. Yeah. Um, Maxi. I would say to look out for immediately, you, you can do it within a few interactions or if you're like in the trenches, the the level and volume of communication really is most often um, inversely proportional to the level of trust within the organization. That's really where your culture starts and the awareness starts. Thank you so much. Huge round of applause, please, for this amazing panel. And can we keep the applause going and say thank you to this amazing village to the volunteers, to the AV team, to Snow and JC and the ushers and the team. Let's say thank you. I want to like make you all applaud for yourselves as well, but how are your hands doing? But thank you all so much for joining us and for the questions. Very much appreciate it.